we go. Intro time. Hey, everybody. Thanks very much for hanging out with us again today. We are super stoked. As I've said before, many a times, I'm as fired up as a spider monkey on Mountain Dew for this one. Everybody give it up for the one, the only, the senior advisor of organic and emerging markets at the beautiful United States Department of Agriculture, sitting right here behind me on the screen. Welcome, <laughs> Marnie Carlin. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Todd. It's so good to be here. I'm excited to get the chance to chat with you. I'm excited to see you. And I'm excited to chat with you as well. You are, uh, you and I go back a long way. You're, mm -hmm. I'm a fan favorite, as I say, a mm -hmm. fanboy. I am super excited that you're in this position. I'm, you know, really excited about what you're doing and what's going on and being a part of this process of up, uplifting and bringing people into the conversation. I think it's just so important that we continue to do this. So I thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day uh, and hanging out with me a little bit. And I think this will be a fun chat. I think people are going to be really inspired to hear what you're about, what's going on, what's going on at the department, what your role is, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. So I got a bunch of questions as I normally do. Most of them don't suck. There might be one that sucks. I doubt it. They're probably going to be okay. But I thought it'd be kind of fun just to get people up to speed a little bit on like, Who's Marnie? Give us a little update on your bio and your history and what kind of got you to this point, you know, wasting an afternoon hanging out with me on uh, Todd Versations. Todd Versations. I'm, again, I'm so excited to be here. Um, and so what, what got me here? Well, I am, um, I'm this strange mix of a lawyer, policy wonk, chef, foodie, um, person who's really passionate about building a healthier, more sustainable food system. Um, and so I've done that. I sort of built my career leading, sort of as I see it, leading leading to this very moment <laughs> of being at the department and of being here with you and everyone who's, who's watching. So I started out my career um, in the practice of law, and then I shifted my focus into policy work, spent some time on Capitol Hill working for the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, I then moved on to the Organic Trade Association, where I led their government relations department. And mm -hmm. in 2016, so I, my whole career until that point was, was here in D.C. Um, in 2016, I kind of took a little leap of faith, um, moved to New Orleans, hung up my own shingle, um, consulted with a bunch of stakeholders who were interested in developing a healthier food system. A lot of organic stakeholders, businesses, sure. certifiers. Um, and just before the pandemic hit, I actually found my way back to DC um, and have been here since and was appointed to be senior advisor on organic and emerging markets at the department earlier this year. I love it. So let's yeah. go to the hundred dollar question. What the hell does that mean? What, what is, what is the, so I got to look at it. Cause I, it's just, it's, it's just, it's a great title. It's, it's kind of a ninja title in a lot of ways. I love it. So what is a senior <laughs> advisor of organic and emerging markets? What's it mean? So, you know, what besides it means ninja, is, besides being a ninja, which I mean, you should see my moves, right? I love it. Um, <laughs> so it's um, it's kind of a couple of prongs, right? So in general, what it means is that I am advising across the entire department, advising the secretary and undersecretaries and other, um, you know, relevant folks on organic and emerging markets. So what does that mean in in the organic space? Um, that's sort of probably the easier space to, to describe. You know, it means thinking about how organic fits in everything the department is doing. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, we all know the National Organic Program, which does such amazing work in um, being the regulatory and enforcement and kind of market development body of, of organic. But organic farmers and organic stakeholders, they also think about things like research and like conservation and, um, you know, climate smart ag, things that go on outside of NOP at the department. And so sure. it's a really exciting opportunity to have someone who kind of tries to bridge those gaps and make sure that organic is at the table in those other conversations. Um, there was a role like this in the Obama administration um, and, and the role was not, uh, was not continued in the Trump administration, but it's really exciting to have it back um, just so that organic can really be a part of the conversation. And then thinking about emerging markets, um, I kind of, sometimes I think of it like, you know, 40 years ago, organic was an emerging market. Um, and right. now organic's not, we're, we're here. Um, but it's thinking about other, other types of um, production or opportunities that maybe historically USDA hasn't, hasn't thought as much about. Um, sure. And should we be thinking about them? And should Absolutely. we make sure that they fit, you know, in all the different spots? So it's an exciting role. Um, oh, there's no you know, doubt. I learn new stuff every day, which is pretty great. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine you probably get more than one email a day, maybe three, probably three emails a, a day. Yeah, a couple. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, 
I, I love the fact that we're talking about emerging markets because I, I think that, you know, when I think of emerging markets, I think of several different things. And I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about a couple of them. But I think it's so important that we start to embrace that because we are going to have to make changes agriculturally to support this planet moving forward. There's just no two ways about it. Whether it's, mm-hmm. whether, like I say all the time, whether it's the population that's coming, the aliens coming down, whatever the case may be, we're going to have a lot of people showing up here and then we're going to have to figure out how to feed them. And the system that we have now, you know, it's going to be a challenge to pull that off in a lot of ways. And so, you know, to me, I love the fact that, you know, we do have emerging markets. So I want to touch on that really quickly. Um, you know, you, you touched on the fact that they're important. And I can think of just, you know, a couple I want to throw out there just for conversation when I think about emerging markets. And one of which is hemp, um, which I think is something that we should talk about, especially when you take a look at the history of hemp and how we kind of screwed hemp over through our history, as opposed to letting it move forward. You know, when you get into the whole drama about the paper business and all of this other stuff, it's really an interesting story if somebody wants to dive in a little bit. Uh, and the other one I think is, is, is ag technology or CEA, you know, controlled environment mm-hmm. ag is another area of emerging uh, markets that I think is worthwhile. So I'm going to throw hemp at you first, and then I'm going to come back to CEA and, and we'll see where it takes us. Absolutely. So yeah, hemp is is one example of an emerging market where I'm getting to sort of step in and make sure that, that again, it's being thought about across the department. So as you probably know, in the 2018 Farm Bill, um, sort of Congress authorized regulation of hemp production at USDA. Um, and so there's a program within AMS um, mm-hmm. that focuses on that. Um, but there's a bunch of, you know, there's one as, as with everything, right? There's open questions. It's not just the sort of cut and dry regulation. There are questions around, um, you know, USDA uh, regulates production, but, but what happens post-production, right? right. What, who, who are the regulators there? And of course, you, you um, get yourself into some con- interesting conversations where, you know, DEA has a claim towards thinking about, you know, we, we could regulate certain pieces. The FDA has a claim around food and final products. And so it's really, there's an opportunity to think um, as the entirety of the federal government and say, how should this be? You know, to, right. your, to your point, Todd, like we spent a lot of years kind of not touching this and ignoring it. And now we've said, this is a legitimate piece of agriculture. Mm-hmm. Let's make, let's figure out how to how to regulate it appropriately and how to um, create opportunities for it to be really successful. Um, and to, I mean, you know, you, you said it, like we think about, we think about building back better, right. And we think about um, evolving agriculture to think about it through a new lens um, as our society changes, as our needs change, as our pers- perspective on things change. And so hemp is a really cool opportunity to say, Hey, we had a perspective about this years ago. We've decided that that's not quite where we are. Let's figure out where we should be, um, and right. let's do it really, um, you know, rationally and using using the entire the entirety of government to to think about those things. Well, you know, at the end of the day, I say it all the time: common sense wins the day. And I think this is a, a classic example of where common sense needs to come in because you're talking about a plant that they planted around, you know, Chernobyl to suck up the t- toxicity out of the ground. Uh, <laughs> you can you can make building blocks out of it. You can make clothes mm-hmm. out of it. You can make paper out of it. You can make fuel out of it. It's unbelievable. And in tech, you know, and I, people are going to laugh and say, it, but it's a weed, right? Essentially. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's amazing what a thing could do. So I'm glad to see that you guys are coming around and grabbing this thing and trying to get our arms around it, because yep. I think it's a really viable thing to have into our system and our society and onto our plant. It's going to make a difference. The plant does make a difference. So I'm excited yep. about that. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear it. The next one is one that I think is, is, is to me is really interesting. I, I, I love ag technology. I love, you know, not all of it's great. I'm not going to lie. There's some <laughs> stuff out there. It's a little, a little scary, but there's some really great stuff that's out there as well. When I think about feeding the world, I think about some of these different things. You know, I, I think sometimes we get caught up when we think about, you know, like a controlled environment stuff, you know, we get caught up in some of these different things that are going on, these different likes and dislikes, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you know, you got to start somewhere to get somewhere, right? Every path has a beginning. Every path has an end in a lot of ways. And I think that when I look at what's happening in the ag tech space today, I find so many exciting things coming out of it that, you know, maybe it's a patent that somebody came up with that's going to change the world for, for a dirt guy or, or for a country, whatever the case may be. So to me, I, I, I try to have no blinders when it comes to ag technology, except, of course, for the scary stuff. But that I might have a little bit more to say with. But nonetheless, so I want to talk about CEA a little bit because, it is a topic that's, you know, getting a lot of airwaves in a lot of ways, both positive and negative. And, 
I'm certainly not afraid to talk about it. I know you're not, but I think it's really important to see what the, you know what you guys are talking about when it comes to CEA. So can you share a little bit about how CEA plays into that emerging market mentality? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would love to sort of cabinet into that emerging market space, you know, and sort of not get into whether CEA should be organic or not, um, separate, yeah. separate issue. Um, but in the emerging market space, you know, I think it's really important as we think about building a, um, a more equitable, a more resilient, a more climate smart food and agriculture system sure. that we just we just sort of take off their, the preconceived notions we have about what agriculture should look like or always has looked like um, and think about are there ways not to replace, um, but to to sort of create a big tent, right? And to think about um, ways to build a better food system. And so when I think mm-hmm. about some of the stuff that folks are doing in the CEA space, I get really excited and this is this is my personal opinion. I will say, you know, and in, inside the, the department, I'm working with, I'm working with folks in the urban ag office and, and all across the department, thinking about um, sort of what is best for CEA. But from a personal perspective, I just really think um, there's there's such opportunity to look at CEA as a piece of the puzzle to building a more resilient um, and more equitable and more climate smart food system. And I'll give a couple of of examples. I mean, I think Mm -hmm. that when it comes to resilience, I think one of the things that is super exciting about CEA is that it can bring food production closer to to eaters, right? Um, And it can sort of create these regional regional locations where food is being produced. Um, And I think that when we think about a supply chain that um, had some vulnerabilities that we saw last year, we've seen, you know, throughout, but we saw, you know, in, in glaring detail last year, Bringing food production closer to eaters can't be a bad thing, has to be a piece of our conversation. Um, Mm -hmm. When I think about equity and I think about, you know, the same thing, bringing that food production closer to eaters, bringing those food and agriculture jobs into inner cities and into um, places where where folks maybe haven't historically had access to nutritious food and access to nutritious food jobs. Um, Mm -hmm. And and how much does that build an economy? I mean, I just really think... Um, again, I, I, I'm not. I'm not in the market. I'm kind of. I'm kind of a. I, I'm a big tent thinker. I'm the kind of person who thinks there's lots and lots. Of, there's no one right answer. There's lots of solutions, no. and I just think this is one of them. You know, this is this is Agreed. a piece. So. Yeah, I agree. And I, and again, it goes back to the same thing as Kent. It's look. It, we need a common sense approach. We need to have common sense conversations, and we need to look at this thing, and recognize that. To your point, you know, I, I use this analogy all the time. Why can't somebody in the desert of Dubai get fresh produce because it's right outside the city limits or inside the city limits in a warehouse, whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about being climate smart, and I want to lean into that here in a second, but when you think mm-hmm. about that, what's more climate smart than a, than a box of produce going 10 miles to a grocery store than 2000, mm-hmm. right? When you start to weigh all these things out. So I think it's important that we embrace some of this stuff. And I, and I know that you know, to me, um, we can't run from it. We have to run towards it and we need to be able to embrace it. So I appreciate your candor. I appreciate you you sharing that a little bit with us on it. So mm-hmm. I, I want to talk, since you brought up Climate Smart, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. First of all, um, it, it's a word that's Jeff definitely being used from, this, from the current administration, something that's talked about all the time. I think it's, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, so why is Climate Smart um, Ag important to understand? You know, I think it's important you know, from where I sit, I think it's really important to um, to sort of acknowledge that we are facing a climate crisis, um, mm-hmm. that we are on the front lines of that, and that we need to do something. We need to we need to we need to act. We probably should have acted years ago, um, and we sure need to act now. Yeah. And so, you know, from from where I sit, we all we all do. And so, when I think about agriculture, I think you know, agriculture can be a part of the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and here too, it's, it's back to that whole big tent, that whole, like, there's no one right answer. Like from, from the way I, th- I think about it is every step that we can make to make what we're doing a little more climate smart, that's a good thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, could we be using fully organic, um, practices? Absolutely. That's fantastic. Is that the only answer? No. Um, it's an answer and it's an answer that needs to be at the table. And I think organic um, production practices and organic farmers should be at the table and demonstrating um, through their their data and their research and their experience 
what works, you know, what we, we do have this great, this great data on that sort of how organic practices do, do help. But I also think it's really important to just sort of ensure that we're all moving in the right direction, right? So if you've right. got conventional farmers who say, I would like to take on one, you know, one climate smart practice, I, I wouldn't throw that out with the bathwater. You know, I wouldn't, th- I wouldn't right. throw that out because they haven't gotten all the way to, to, to organic. Um, and so I really think, I think that we've, and we've we've got to sort of kind of take a whole of government and whole of of our economy and our our society approach to this. I think we've it's a um, you know it's a problem that affects us all and that we all contribute to and that we can all be a part of solving. Um, and right. so I think I think that's really critical. Well, I love the, yeah right solvent. That's a great great word to use. Right? How are we going to solve these things? Again, it goes back to what I said earlier. It's, you know these these are really common sense issues or, or issues that require common sense. These are issues that require the right, the stakeholders in the room, you know, again, and I talk about this in fact this morning with somebody, you know, we need to make sure that we've got farmer A that represents, you know, a hundred acres in the room with the farmer B that represents 10,000 acres because those conversations are, while they're similar, right? They mm-hmm. drive the tractor the exact same way. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's not similar. And those common sense conversations, that reality of what we're doing together to, to, to move the ball down the field in a positive way, to your point, climatically, to make a difference in this planet, to make a difference in our lives, to make a difference in a lot of different ways um, is really, really important. So I commend you guys for, for taking the time to really think about that and why that word climate, I think, is so important. We put it next to the word agriculture. Um, you, you touched on something uh, earlier, and I, and I, I want to ask you about it. And, that, and that's really what is, what is an equitable food system and, and why does that matter? So can you touch on that? Because you brought it up. I just want to get a little deeper into that, in, a little deeper yeah. into that thought process. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in everything we do at the department, we're committed to the values of equity and inclusion. Um, and we're taking actions to root out generations of systemic racism and to integrate equity into the policymaking that we do. Um, and it's important. I mean, it's almost hard for me to answer why it's important because to me, it's just, it's so fundamental. Um, but I think, you know, when we think about well, what does that mean? Like, those are a lot of really nice words um, and, and sort of they, they, they sound flowery, but what does that mean? You know, I think it means, um, I think it means equity in access to safe and nutritious and affordable food. I think it means equity in access to the programs that the department offers and the investments that we make. Um, if we have historically been underserving um, certain communities or certain types of farmers, um, or certain types of research projects, mm-hmm. we need to be thinking about that. And we need to say to ourselves, does this actually reflect, um, does this actually reflect the reality of the, to- of the totality of, of right. the beauty that is American agriculture? And if not, let's, let's make, make it so, um, yeah. you know, and it reflects, it's not just access to food. It's not just access to programs. It's, you know, thinking about, um, supporting jobs or research or, or job training um, in communities of color and communities that that um, that maybe haven't had as much access, because you know you made the point just a second ago. You said it's about getting the uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but getting the hundred acre farmer and the ten, and the ten thousand acre farmer right. at the table, right? And to me, that's actually also a story about equity, right? It's yeah. it's getting both of those people at the table and ha- and having them talk to each other and understand that here's a lot of ways that we're different, but you know what? There's also a lot of ways that we can learn from each other and that we do the same thing, you know, and, and, and hearing, you know, being, being um, open to having those conversations, hearing from each other and, you know, accepting that maybe we've done, maybe we haven't um, opened the doors well enough to a certain set of folks in the past. Mm -hmm we need to open those doors now. Like we don't, we don't have yeah. to sort of, you know, ham and haw about why and what Let's open the doors, you know, and let's make sure everyone's at the table. I agree with you. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I, I think what's really important and what I'm taking out of what's happening in my conversations with Jenny and just, you know, myself getting, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a little bit more involved in, 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 is that a lot of what happens is I think that the 10% speak for the other 90% in a lot of ways. And I think we have to reverse that if we want to try to work on things like trying to find equality, because if we don't have the right, we don't have the voices there. If you don't hear what the voice, you know, what do you do? If, if, if somebody's not speaking, then you don't know. And I think mm-hmm. it's important that we bring folks like to your point to the table. I think it's really, really important. Of course, obviously in a perfect world, it'd be great not to have conversations anymore. 
about equality. It'd be nice for that just to kind of go away. And it's just like, look, we're all together. We're all one community. We all live under the same sun. We all live on the same rock floating around in space, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of a trip. Um, you know, and it, we need to come together on this. And, I, and I'm, you know, I, I hope and I appreciate what you guys are doing. And I look forward to, you know, continuing to push that narrative because I think it's really, really important. And it's, it's much, again, it's much broader. It, it's, it's, it's a broad issue in a lot of avenues and to yeah. the point of, you know, a hundred acres to a thousand acre farm, whatever it might be, that does need to be represented. So I'm glad to see that you guys are taking that, taking that charge forward. When it comes to like resiliency in the system, that's something I think is not a lot of people talk about. And I know it's something that, that is really, I think an important part of that. And like, what is resilient food system even mean? Um, I think that's something, you know, to me, it's, it's probably a pretty worthy question to throw at you right now because you guys have a lot of power. Let's, you know, the USDA is, you know, you guys are a big purchaser too, right? You have power of procurement. So I think about those things. I think about resiliency, the power of procurement. So I want to kind of maybe tie those two together and see if, see if I don't screw you up too bad and throw you a curveball. But if you can work with it, work with me on it. No, it's good. And I'll talk a little bit about what I think resilience is. And then I'll talk about, I'm thrilled to have a chance to talk about procurement, which I actually think ties in, um, can tie in resilience and equity and climate smart, all the things yeah. we're talking about. Um, so yeah, when I think about a resilient food, food system or agriculture system, I think about one that, you know, isn't, uh, isn't as fragile as what we saw in the last, last year or two, sort of has some has some safeguards built in to manage bottlenecks, supply constraints, to sort of um, create more um, strength against vulnerabilities. Because vulnerabilities are going to come up. Like it's not sure. that we that we can get rid of all the vulnerabilities. What we have to do is create enough enough give in the system. I sound like an engineer, which I'm not, but but create enough enough give in the system so that if something crazy happens, we can pivot. We can mm -hmm. we can sort of you know move on. And, and I I don't want to say that our food system, you know, failed last year because, because we definitely did pivot and we moved on, but we could, we could do it better. Right. We could learn right. from that. And so I think about things like, um, distributing our food system a little more regionally and locally and a little less sort of nationally hubbed. I think that that would create resilience so that if something goes wrong somewhere, whether it's, um, you know, a transportation issue, whether it's, you know, I'm from Louisiana, whether it's a hurricane, um, sure. that we still have, a, you know, that doesn't impact our entire food system. We're able to kind of, to redistribute around hubs. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's strengthening the supply chain to sort of, um, you know, respond better to those things. And then also to ensure that there's value to growers and workers, right? Because I think right. part of what makes our system less resilient is, um, is an imbalance in how we perceive the value of growers and workers and other spots along the supply chain. And so I think right. that's a really important piece. Um, right. So none of that had to do with procurement, but I'll, but I'll say that I think, I, I do think, I mean, you made the point that we have this, uh, this great power of, of this great purchasing power at the department and in the federal government where we purchase mm -hmm. a lot of food and we can choose to, purchase that food in um, in a way that supports all of these goals that we've been talking about, right? right? So we can think about, you know, do we want to choose purchasing food from more local and regional, um, you know, vendors, farmers, those, those sorts of things? Do we want to think about, um, so that would get to some resilience. Do we want to think about purchasing food from um, companies that pay their farmers and their workers fairly? I mean, sure. maybe right that that that's a that's a value that we're trying to build do we want to do we want to think about when we purchase food for schools do we want to think about climate smart and sort of do some preferencing around that about around growing practices that are climate smart i would sure think so um yeah. and then on equity too why why on earth would we not think about um preferring or or thinking about spending our, our procurement dollars um with folks who are maybe underserved or who are who are producing foods that are culturally and regionally relevant to the, mm -hmm. to the place that we're buying it for. Sure. These are opportunities. We don't have, that's the thing. Like we don't have to do all of our work in like the, the policy sphere thinking about big, you know, some of the work we can do is just impact the market, buy things right. to, to drive that. And so that's, that's an area that I'm, I'm pretty excited about thinking about. Well, you know, I, I say it all the time and I'm a big believer in it, right? The positive cost of food. Right. And making these investments into these the, exactly what you just described, in my opinion, is a positive cost of food. Right. I mean, putting energy into this, because, again, it goes back to 
what is this guy doing today? How do we help him get to tomorrow? And what did we learn? And what it may, you know, that tomorrow may be the greatest idea that's ever come out of it, right? And so I think it's really important. I love, you know, in my mind to see us as a country start to uplift some of these voices that have not been uplifted before and start to look at some of these things under a different light. Again, I want to call it common sense in some respect. But again, I go back to the positive cost of food. It's worth investing money into these things uh, to see what happens, to see where they go. Where is it going to take us? Because you know, we don't have a lot of second generation farmers coming in a lot of aspects. We certainly don't have third generation farming. Um, it's becoming a tougher and tougher hustle. It really, really is. And it's food. Mm-hmm. And, and to my mind, it's like, you know, that's not the, you know, that's, a, that's not a side hustle job. That's a full-time <laughs> gig, right? That's a big deal. If we start messing with our food supply, we're going to be in trouble. You talk mm-hmm. about, you know, we talk about oil dependency, all these other things. You start becoming a country that becomes food dependent. You wait to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Right. That's scary. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm appreciative of that. Again, that, that bigger vision. Again, I hate to use the word common sense, but it's really what it is. It's, it's just really a common sense approach to say, mm-hmm. you know, we have to look down here to get this up here. And I think it's just super important. So I love it. So let's come. Let's talk about some new and exciting stuff. Let's let's get into, you know, there are some pretty cool things that you guys are doing, um, specifically things that I've caught my eye, or at least I've read a bit, one of which is some standard work. Another one is your transition program, which I do want to touch on a little bit more in depth. And then, you know, kind of market development. Those are kind of the three I had. So you want to talk with standards first? I don't want to curveball you. I can, I can, you know, however, let's go to standards. Why don't you show us kind of new and what's exciting there? Sure. I mean, standards, you know, I would just say that, um, you know, the, the National Organic Program is uh, sort of continuously improving and continuously responding to what stakeholders and what the NOSB um, recommend. And we're really thinking about we're, we, we acknowledge, or I, I would say I acknowledge that um, there's, there's been some delay of time um, in a variety of recommendations from NOSB, and, and we're really committed as a department to um, continuing to make progress, to um, moving forward. You know, as, as everyone knows, there's a, there's a few standards kind of in the works um, mm-hmm. right now, the origin of livestock, the organic livestock and poultry standards, and of course, the strength in organic enforcement rule. And then, you know, our, we're, we're, we've got sort of some thinking along the way around sort of next steps to really mm-hmm. continuously improve and to make sure that we are um, serving the the needs of the sector and really being a good partner. You know, the whole organic, um, at least in the context of the department, um, has, has always been a public-private partnership. And so we want to make sure that we are that we, as the public piece of that, are meeting the needs of the private sector, um, mm-hmm. are serving as a partner, you know, and 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 bringing those those like strong standards that folks really want to make sure that the that the that the seal means exactly what we know that it does. Sure. Um, well, I'm also. Know, I, I'm, oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say I'm excited about the fact that you know we're looking at some of these things and pulling stuff out of the desk drawer and reading through. What I'm more excited about is that the opportunity to bring these things back into the conversation piece. To bring these things back for review, to bring these things back to the, you know, for the public to comment and to get into a meeting and be able to kind of like, okay, because let's face it, in agriculture, what you did 10 months ago, 10 years ago is Mm -hmm. completely different, right? And a lot of things, especially technology, right? It changes every day. So I'm excited that, you know, we're moving that ball forward. I think it's it's great. It's great to have those conversations started again. Yeah. And that's, I will say that those conversations are, are so critical to me. I, I, I maybe haven't said that, but you, you dragged my memory, which is that, um, you know, I think it's critically important that we at the department that I in particular, th- that I hear from people. Right. So, yeah. so it's, it's tough because, you know, we're still in this, in this um, limited travel time. And so I've been having these great listening sessions with folks via zoom, um, but I'm really, which are fantastic. And also I'm really looking forward to, you know, hopefully in the new year, having the opportunity to, um, to get to some of the conferences that farmers are going to and, and hear what they need and hear what, what their frustrations are and what they're thinking about. Um, because that's really our job, right? Um, yeah. To make sure we're hearing what's going on on the ground and then responding to that. Are you going to roll in on Air Force One? I'm just asking. No, <laughs> haven't, haven't heard that I will. No, I'm probably going to be just flying saying. a flying Air, Air commercial. <laughs> Air, Force, Air Force Two <laughs> <laughs> or Three. <laughs> Yeah. I might be about 17. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So one of the areas that you guys are putting a lot of money at right now is this transition conversation. And of course, everybody freaks out when it comes to the transition conversation organic. So the first thing they start to think about is 
some kind of a new seal or something, you know, this transitional seal that's going to go into the marketplace. It's going to, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's, it's probably, you know, it's, it's a pretty hot topic. You know, I know that folks have tried it. Some companies have tried it in the past. It hasn't worked mm-hmm. out for them, you know, and I, and I understand why I can understand somebody that's put all the effort and energy in to get to a point of being certified organic. And all of a sudden here comes something that's, you know, it's kind of that old, you know, uh, eat a bag of fries and drink a diet Coke and they're going to cancel each other out mentality. It doesn't work. Right. So it makes it a real challenge for folks. So this transition program that you guys are working on, and again, I'd like you to touch on a little bit, doesn't involve any kind of a consumer label, mm-hmm. right? So it's really about how to, and I think it goes back to your, the power of procurement in a lot of ways conversation, right? How do we help drive more acreage into this deal? How do we help uplift these growers that need to transition their ground to get it to the certified organic state? So how do we help them? So can you touch a little bit about the transition program? Because I think it's important. Yeah, and thank you for, for framing that up. That was really, really helpful. So yeah, I mean, I think, Folks probably know that the secretary, Secretary Vilsack, announced earlier in the year a multi-hundred million dollar um, investment into supporting organic transition, and it's really exciting. Um, it's it's an opportunity that we haven't had in the past. It's a it's a real opportunity to think about how do we support uh, transition of domestic acres, and how do we um, support the development of the market that will support that. And so what I mean by that is not just the consumer market, um, because that actually in some ways may may not be the the hardest part, but the entire supply chain, right? The processing market and all of this, because because what what we don't want to see is um, incentivizing incentivizing transition of acres and then nowhere for that good to go, right? Right. That that is is not not the solution. So when we think about supporting transition and through, through this investment, we think about a, a few things. We think about, um, one of the things we think about is, is farmer development, is really right. investing in the support, the education, the training that farmers really need to um, to make transition successful, to make it so that they have that community of folks they can go to and say, you know, how do I navigate this OSP thing? Or how do I navigate right. the regulations? Or where do I find an input supplier? You know, all sorts of things. We need to be to be building um, sort of a training network um, on that front, and then a second piece um, is is this this piece that I've been thinking about in the context of market development, which is which is what I was talking about um, just a second ago. That you know we can't just bring the farmers in and then hope for the best. We have to actually you know support and develop the entire yeah. market. And so thinking about well, where where do we have um, limitations? Where are limitations in um, you know, storage, are they in transportation? Are they in processing? Um, where are they? And then what can we do to create opportunities to build those at the same time that we're trying to build the acres so that we don't have that sort of, you know, imbalance or or bad timing. And then the other piece that we, that I think about is, you know, a lot of the, the existing programs, um, that we have in the department sort of making sure that they make sense for organic. Uh, making sure that conservation programs make sense for organic and crop insurance programs and and also making sure that um, that we've got staff trained in the department not just not just me and not just our amazing NOP staff but folks across all of the mission areas and across all of the field offices the FSA offices who know a little bit about organic or at least who know enough to be able to then ask and direct to the right to the right person because what what you don't want is a farmer to go into his FSA office and ask a question about what you know whether x and such program is available to him and have a staff or just not know or not right. or, or or say the wrong thing and so I think there's a real opportunity for us to make sure that we're um, kind of integrating organic more into all of the department both headquarters and in the field um, so when I look you know honestly when I think about this transition program I really I think that that a portion of it is really really dedicated to um, transition and transitioning farmers. And I think there's a portion of it that's going to help organic. It's just going to rise, rise uh, or lift all of organic. And, and to me, that's, that's exactly as it should be. That's, you know, if we build this market, if we build this, this processing capacity, et cetera, um, that's not just going to help transitioning farmers. <laughs> so, yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, it'd be lovely to be in a world where it was 100% organic and nobody had to worry and it just was what it was. I mean, it's maybe someday, who knows, doubtful, but, you know, it'd be great to get there. We're, we got a little bit of a chunk now. You know, I mean, uh, way back when I started before electricity, we had zero chunk. We had nothing. We had no market. There was no market share. 
But you know, mm-hmm. market share was, right? I mean, it was a farmer's market mentality. It was mm-hmm. trying to bust into a retail channel to get it going. Now you've got this behemoth that's out there that's 60 plus billion dollar industry. It's going to be a hundred. I mean, look, it's, it's going to be 200. It'll be $200 billion before I get, you know, hang my hat up. I guarantee you that because it's growing by leaps and bounds. It's going to continue. So I think it's important that we invest into this. It's important that we do everything we can because, you know, no matter, no matter how you look, I think, at this organic world, right, whether it's from technology, blah, 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 whatever, however you want to frame it, at the end of the day, it's still about the food. Right. And the food, you know, I think sometimes we lose sight of the fact that the food is really the really the winner and the most important part in a lot of this conversation, because food is a drug. Food is medicine. Food can help us. Right. And if we can get more food into people's hands, we know we know that, you know, proper food, good at good nutrition at the school level in school lunches, except elevates grades, makes kids smart, makes kids better at class and all these other things. So we know it's important. So I'm glad to see us investing in this. I'm glad we're investing in the organic side of this equation because I think we need to. Um, you know, it's a great common sense approach to tomorrow. And I think it's wonderful. So I'm glad. And, and everybody can chill out a little bit about this label that they're all freaking out about because it's not the case, right? We got to find a way, we have to find a way to win the day for everybody. And I'm glad to see that you guys are taking such a, um, open-minded approach to this and not, not doing something that just, that you're helping everybody by this process. You're not That's hurting anybody in this product. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's not, the goal. Because, because you could have, because you could have walked in and said, boom, here's a label, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden it's just this spiraling domino. It's, it's a negative effect. This mm-hmm. is a positive effect, and the direction you're heading is a positive direction. When you talk really quickly, and if I just touch on it a little bit about market development, you know, and and I, I want to make sure that that we covered it. And I just I know because to me it's I I, I think it's such an important thing is working on developing that market. I just want to make sure we did. If we did, I'll shut up and we can, we're, I'm, we can chill. But if you wanted to add anything to the market development side, I just wanted to make sure that I covered it. No, I think I'm good. I mean, I think it's, it's really, it's just thinking about, um, you know, making sure that um, this is so corny, but if we build it, they will come, right? So we have, yeah. we have to build that. We, we, we want to incentivize the production of the, of the, of the product. And we also have to make sure that the product can go through its entire life through processing, through, through, you know, packaging, through transport, all the way to, to the, to the final consumer. Right. And so right. if that doesn't work, then, then it's, um, then I, then I don't think the, the program has reached its, um, its potential. Right. I don't right. think, I don't think what we're doing has reached its potential. So, um, so yeah, that's, I love it. Anything else? Do we miss anything? Do we, I mean, I asked a lot of quick questions. I don't think, think so. I think, I think we hit on everything. I, I, this I, has been I, kind of a, a, a whirl, whirlwind round robin. What well, is? Of, well, that's that, that's that's kind of what this format is. We go we go mm-hmm. fast. We go quick. Um, you know, we try to cover stuff. We try to get stuff. But more importantly, you know, I what I when I reached out to you, we started talking a little bit. It's like, look, I know who you are, but a lot of people don't know who you are. And you've got this position. You know, you're 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 there. You're doing some big things. And you're making some big changes. And I thought it was really important to get people to get to know you a little bit, but also to get a little bit inside of where your brain's at and what's going on and get that like, hey people actually work in the government. It's weird. There's, you know, you, we see what we see on TV, but there's a lot of people that work in the government that are really important people doing some really big, heavy lifting stuff. So that's why I love this platform of being able to continue these conversations really to uplift people and really to let people understand. It's like, wow, this is great. I didn't realize, I didn't realize that person did that. So I appreciate you coming on and share. Will you come back by the way? Will you come back and do another I update. Will. This has been so much fun. And I, I just want to say, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to introduce myself to folks and to, um, to, to sort of share a bit and sort of open the, con- the way I see it, it's opening the competition with you and with everyone who's, who's listening. You know, I, I'm yeah. here, people can find me. I would love to keep, you know, keep the conversation going. Um, and, and you're right. I will say one thing that you just said about, you know, people working in the government. I, I, I will say that I have been, um, I'm, I'm so honored and excited to have this role. And I have been so um, inspired by the people I get to work with. And yeah. I just think it's worth saying that. I think it's worth people knowing I hadn't worked in the, in the executive branch before. And um, I think it's really, really worth saying that, you know, you come in and you're just surrounded by people who are passionate about the work they're doing, really hardworking. Um, and it's not always, it's, it's very rarely easy. Um, and people yeah. are just are really, um, are really committed to building a better food and ag system. And I'm just, I'm just lucky to be along for the ride. So I think it's great. And I say, it, you know, I, I say all the time, thank you, by the way, 
Right. I'm going to say thank you for uh, all the people in the 25 plus countries that are listening to us, all the people here in the States are listening to us. Thank you. Right. Because you guys get up every day and do a job that nobody actually knows you do. Right. They don't. It's true. I hate to, I mean, I know that sounds crappy, but it's the truth, right? People, it's like, oh, it just happened. Well, no, it didn't happen because there's 30 people behind making it happen. And so thank you for, for uh, taking on this challenge. And I know it is right. And, yeah. and so I appreciate it. So open invitation to come back. I'd love to have you come back. Let's do another round table. Let's throw some stuff out. We'll talk, keep people informed about what's going on. You know that you have an open yep. invitation to come on board. Um, and then we you know what next time, maybe next time we're going to go, we'll go a little bit deeper, we'll go a bit long form stuff. We'll get a little bit who knows where I'll take it. You know, you didn't even get to play any trivia with me today. Oh, I, trivia. I know. Well, yeah, no, I'll take you down. Yeah. We'll, I'll take you down a dark slope. We'll have fun. We'll, we'll get you out there. We'll have a good time. I'm I'm game next. You just let me know when and I'll be here. I love it. Thank you very much, Marty, very, for being here. I appreciate you. I appreciate what you do. Thank you for your candor and your openness and transparency. It's what we need to win the day, right? It's that common sense approach. It's what we need to win the day right now. So thank you for being here. Um, I'm glad you're coming back. Everybody. Thanks for watching. Marnie's awesome. She opened, she, she said, reach out, talk to her. Marnie, you're going to get a million emails. It's not my fault. I'm not, it's all don't good. Blame me. It's my job. That's my job. Don't blame me. Just make sure you answer mine. That's all I care about. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for hanging out with us. We appreciate you. Remember, you know, Marnie inspired me a little bit. She fired me up a little bit about the positivity that's coming out of it. And you could do that yourselves every day. Go inspire somebody. It's not hard to do. If, if you just did it one time a day, you'll figure out how to do it twice a day. We make the ball go down the field much easier. All right. So go inspire somebody. It's really important. Marty, thank you again for being here. I appreciate you. Thanks. Take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.